Cardenas and I was uh, here discussing the ideas around art and science and sustainability um, and I think Grotto is actually, we need more places that are doing things like Grotto is doing, trying to really understand how the collaboration between arts and scientists um, are going to help with uh, wicked problems like sustainability and climate change. All right, let me see what I can do here. I feel like a rock star now. <laughs> So sustainability challenges are considered wicked problems in the context that there uh, is no easy solution for them. And the challenge of actually solving a problem that is always moving um, is why sustainability has needed people to kind of muddle through that process and iterate through that process. And most of these problems have kind of been addressed in kind of the scientific light. So one of the questions that we have to ask is, within science are we achieving the deep cultural change that sustainability needs? And are there other pathways that haven't been adequately explored? And so I think one of the things that we're looking forward to doing here is really thinking about how the arts and humanities can inject some of, some of the much needed meaning and cultural force into the concept. And so I've broken this up into kind of three ways that I think about how the arts and, the sci and, and science intersect with sustainability. One of them is idea translation, uh, which has to do with, uh, by the by getting together, you can actually propel ideas beyond institutional boundaries, which becomes such a difficult thing as a, as a disciplinarian. Uh, two is hot cognition, and this is the idea that uh, artists, humanists, writers can kind of inject so much, uh, a lot of the kind of visceral and experiential components to um, the, the ideas that are kind of being found in science. And so this idea comes from Herbert Simon. Uh, and so he noted that if we are to learn our social science from novelists, then the novelists have to get it right. Uh, the scientific content, content must be valid. So it's this idea that you have this uh, relationship with somebody in a different field that allows you to kind of uh, test your ideas and make sure your ideas are credible as you work through them. A good example of this is uh, Silent Spring by Rachel Carson. And so a lot of the ideas, a lot of the issues around pesticides were already known by biologists and ecologists, but it was her ability to kind of create an emotional response that focused uh, attention on the problem. And so I often like this uh, little comic here that science can tell us how to clone a T-Rex, humanities can tell us why it might be a bad idea. Right? So it's this reflexive process between the two. And finally, problem identification, generation, and framing. So scientific problems aren't just scientific, I'm sorry, sustainability problems aren't just scientific, they're not just technical, they're not social, they're also cultural. And so the arts kind of press a lot on, on that cultural component, and so they need to be there to actually be able to uh, press on those things that we aren't really hitting um, within the other fields. So I started thinking a lot about this with my dissertation, and so, you know, so why should sustainability take aesthetics seriously in this context? And how does one approach an art science practice for sustainability? And how do art science teams work through sustainability challenges? And so I'm going to break this up for you in just a couple of components. Um, first of all, um, a study I did on art science collaborations with uh, triads and then I'll discuss aesthetics a little bit. And so what I was wondering about was how teams would reason together, validate ideas, and hopefully produce a creative, conceptual uh, art science design. And I was also wondering about the mechanisms that improved or hindered the working processes uh, for these teams. And so the project was designed, again, with arts and scientists, triads, working out at uh, the Tres Rios uh, constructed wetland. So this wetland is connected to a wastewater treatment plant and then the water once it's been treated by the by the plant goes into the wetland for a final treatment and then it goes into the river and along this river um, are areas where birders go they bring k through 12 kids here and so they wanted to kind of develop uh, a signage there that um, spoke both to the ecology these ideas of water and so I proposed with the city that they bring, again, ecologists, the wetland ecologists together with, with artists that were interested in the space. And so the ecologists kind of worked at, um, around explaining hydrology, and the artists really thought about the meaning of water in the desert and how important it was, and so for different communities in that area. So I won't show you the designs because we're short on time, but my, my samples were um, <clears throat> two teams of two scientists and artists and then one team of two, sci uh, two artists and a scientist. And some of the things we found was, one, that um, male scientists speak a lot. Um, they tend to speak more than the other, team, the, the other team members. And of the one team that did really well, actually, was the female artists spoke the most. But you can see between the, the red and the green line, 
the, um, the male scientist was really trying to keep up. <laughs> so I came up with about eight components that uh, really have to do with how do how people work uh, uh, with each other kind of in these spaces. And um, so the first one is consensus. And this is the idea of, of how quickly you validate the idea and move on. And so you want to actually delay consensus oftentimes to make sure that you get the best ideas coming forward. But if you delay too long, then obviously you have a, a time frame. So how do you manage that consensus? Um, task conflict is critical. Um, you have to have the right amount of task conflict in order for the uh, project to be engaging. Um, personal conflict, obviously less is better, so not having personal conflict. Um, creative perception really has to do a lot with what Ian's been talking about in the kind of observer context, is the ability of somebody to be able to connect what the scientist is saying and what the artist is saying and seeing how they couple together. And so that's kind of where you get the serendipity that takes place. Um, there's n kind of no uh, a way around intrinsic motivation. These problems are hard. Um, we're not, motiv we're not uh, incentivized to work in these ways. So wanting to work on these things, coming to conferences like this to, to work on projects usually has a lot of intrinsic motivation involved. Um, clarity becomes a big thing. And I think usually it's clarity around language, is understanding what you're saying instead of assuming you understand what the other person is saying, because we use words differently. Um, epistemologically, ontologically, we have different ways of framing the world. And trust and efficacy were really critical. And so for us, efficacy was collective efficacy, uh, a belief that your team had the skills and the desire to actually uh, finish a project to the best of their ability. And again, there's no substitute for participation. And Team 3 had done the best, and we can see that both in meeting time and in outside of meeting time, they, did, they performed better than the, the other two teams. So one of the big things that kind of I pulled away from all of this was one that the process is iterative. It's never like a, a start and an end. You have to keep going through that iteration of, of uh, working together. Um, collective efficacy <clears throat> is critical. If there's too much test conflict, uh, usually you usually get discouraged. If there's not enough, then you're not interested. So the appropriate test conflict keeps you engaged. Um, pacing that consensus so you're aware of kind of the dynamics of the team. Uh, again, asking clarifying questions becomes really critical. Um, working styles vary, recognizing the working styles vary, and then kind of working through that process. So a lot of this actually has to do with um, <clears throat> being very conscious about working with somebody else that doesn't understand things the way you understand them. Um, a boundary object, so for me the boundary object was the wetland. And so the way we think about boundary objects are, um, oftentimes there are actual objects, but they're ways for everybody kind of to inject how they think and how they respond to a place. And that way that surfaces both assumptions and it surfaces ideas that can intersect. So finding something to, to kind of uh, come around uh, uh, for. Um, meeting proximity is important. So one of the issues with a lot of this stuff is that so often you get um, a chance to do this once a year, once maybe every six months. And teams that do that oftentimes have a, a challenge of catching up. They lose momentum. So attempting to have, basically build a relationship with an artist. If, if an artist and scientist want to work together, build a relationship to have constant uh, 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 meeting proximity. And again, motivation is key. So I like to you know, mention oftentimes that art is not just pretty things. It's a problem solving tool, a method for framing problems, um, a shaper and creator of culture, and a mode of knowledge production. People forget it's a mode of knowledge production like science. And we like to overlap them oftentimes, science overlapping on, on art or art overlapping on science. And so what we're really thinking about is how do these, again, intersect and create something very different. And one way to kind of think about this as well is that <clears throat> aesthetics really do inform the way we think about the world oftentimes. And I'm going to give you kind of a definition of how I think of aesthetic. It's from the etymological context that it's to be sensitive to and to perceive or to feel which means that you have a way of maturing your aesthetic around particular uh, uh, constructs. One example of this is the Waterman Creek uh, Prairie Restoration Project. And so they wanted to get, get this project started on a piece of agricultural land that was not ideal. It was steep, um, the irregular lots made it difficult, this is in Iowa, um, the irregular lots made it difficult for farm machinery to get on there. And everyone they spoke to was in favor of the prairie they weren't in favor of the prairie in their backyard where they had kind of agro agricultural prospects. And so a lot of the idea of the prairie represented a loss of those agricultural prospects. And so Kinsey notes um, that the same paradoxical metaphors expressed in art are bounded to the everyday experiences by which communities construct their identities 
and assert their interests. And so oftentimes we don't think that we have particular ideologies that affect the way uh, uh, conservation efforts happen as well. Um, one of the ways in which we've kind of constructed our aesthetic around conservation is from Immanuel Kant. And he came up with this idea, or one of the people that kind of worked on this idea of, on one side the bee, you had what was beautiful. Uh, on the other side, you had what was sublime. And sublime kind of brought about not just feelings of awe, but feelings of terror, and oftentimes feelings that were hard for you to kind of uh, uh, work through. So on the beauty side, you could be sensible. You could think about sensory components. You could think about a rose, you think about the color, the smell, the feel. And all those sensory things were ways of understanding it. But things like wilderness were sublime. And in that way, the only way to kind of understand it was to detach yourself, basically psychologically detach yourself, and use your super sensible senses, which was your, your mental faculties, right? In between that, we end up with the picturesque, right? The countryside and wilderness, and this is what we know so much about, right? And so we, we have our own American form of wilderness that's different from European wilderness because we had so many places that were wild. And so it becomes part of the American identity. And so images like this by, by Carlton Watkins, right, are instrumental in kind of convincing Congress to dedicate Yosemite as the first national park, right? They're the, the typical things that you would think of, mountains, trees, lakes. <sighs> As, as picturesque. Many of you probably know this photographer. Right? And so Ansel Adams actually goes through this process of attempting to conserve uh, particular areas by using his photography again to kind of elicit the sublime, elicit pristine nature. But this hasn't gone away either. So this is the Instagram for the Department of the Interior. They still kind of push the same ideals. These are just codified contexts around what nature should be. And so one of the things that are probably most critical to how we've responded to this is that um, the, the aesthetic that we've been given, that we've co-opted, is an aesthetic of disinterestedness, is where we like to see it as a picture. And actually, um, when these pictures were starting to be made, these paintings were starting to be made, people used to use a, a clawed glass. And the way that you actually used it in order to make a place more picturesque was you would hold it up and you would turn, you would turn your back to the landscape and you would look at it in the glass, and that made it actually even more picturesque. The, the glass was a little vignetted on the sides, so, so it looked even more like a painting. And so it really became sightseeing, instead of thinking about what these places were. Um, virgin wilderness was one of the things that you know, was really kind of pushed forward. Even though Native Americans lived in these places, they, they often uh, assumed that these places were not touched by man. And so it causes a couple of issues, actually, right? So our sacred wilderness is Yellowstone, Yosemite, Grand Canyon, um, but regular places like our backyards are not sacred places. So how do we take care of our everyday places? Right? Cronin uh, points out that you know this idea of wilderness is very much a human creation. He says that the issue with it is that it hides its unnaturalness because of it uh, behind a mass that is all the more beguiling because it seems so natural. Right? So. Wilderness itself is no small part of the problem in the context that we have constructed this idea of what nature is supposed to be. We have um, Aldo Leopold who kind of starts to break from this. And so Leopold was a um, land manager, um, but you probably know him best from a San Coney Almanac when uh, he, he writes a, a lot about um, his place in, in San Coney, Wisconsin. And he notes this kind of in, in his way as well, you know, that. Um, there are those that are willing to be herded in droves through scenic places who find mountains grand if they be proper mountains with waterfalls, cliffs, and lakes. To such, the Kansas Plains are tedious. And he's kind of remarking on a particular point that we're able to consume this stuff but without thinking. And so it's easy for them to think that they've gone through nature. Um, they can't see the nature in the Kansas Plains. And he's gone through himself through kind of this evolution of thinking that we could focus on economic and resource stewardship, or we could connect ethics and morality. And he, kind of, he comes to a conclusion that none of those things were working and realizes that ecology, ethics, and aesthetics uh, are integrated, they're coupled. You can't do one without the other. One of his, probably his most famous lines is, we lost it, one second. One of his most famous lines uh, allude to this, right? A thing is right when it tends to preserve the integrity, stability, and beauty of the biotic community. It's wrong when it tends otherwise. So he's making a strong moral statement, 
um, both around the ecology, around the ethics, and around the aesthetics of a place. And he still believes in the intellect, right? But he has done it in a different way than Kant has, right? He moves away from disinterestedness. And again, he remarks that books uh, on nature seldom mention when they're written behind stoves. So how you can write about nature, but you don't have to necessarily be in it, and you don't have to understand it, right? And so the cognitive components serve to enrich the direct experience. Understanding ecology, your understanding of place, having a relationship with place, enriches your time there. And so we think about this again in a couple of ways. The sustainability is to intersect uh, science and the aesthetics. Um, we have to think about how that, that intersection is informed, uh, how we engage in that space, and how we kind of integrate those different uh, disciplines, those different understandings. And so as an informed aesthetic, he kind of points out that ecology gave us a new mental eye, a new way of understanding systems uh, that operate in the world. But if we include the arts, we come up with a poetic science. Right? And so, excuse me, um, this isn't a, a form of illustration where the art, again, uh, the artist again illustrates what the scientist is telling you, but it was a form of internalization, of understanding how those two, th these two things intersected. Uh, again, an engaged aesthetic was, uh, uh, you have to be in the space to actually understand and care for the space. I always remark that um, scientists often talk about human environment interactions, and I think humanists talk about human environment relationships. And to say that you had an interaction with somebody is very different from saying you have a relationship with somebody. So how those two just change the framing around how we think about our relationship, again, to environment, right? And so all this had to do with, you know, a promotion of perception, um, in the context that that was the creative component. When you got, when you went out and you were able to kind of understand ecological principles, but you were also able to understand why you cared for a place, that was the creative act. And so we've seen that the social sciences and life sciences have worked on sustainability challenges, but we're still kind of missing a humanistic perspective. I think it's coming, but I, I think that it's not, it's, it's currently still marginalized. I, I really like how uh, Von der Lue has kind of pointed to sustainability problems in, in the context of a Rubik's Cube. Now, if you've ever tried to uh, solve a Rubik's Cube, you know that you can't do one side at a time, right? You have to understand all the patterns of a, Ru a Rubik's Cube. You have to understand the algorithms of the Rubik's Cube. Similarly, we can't do the art here. We can't do the life science here, and then do the social science here. They have to be integrated in order to understand how those different things connect, right? These patterns of complexity. And we really haven't worked out the sustainability of that yet. I think it's an it's a ongoing process, but I think the most important thing is, is that we're aware that we're moving, we have to move away from kind of this wilderness aesthetic and understand the sustainability aesthetic really is including humans in this context. So we're coming up to kind of the art practice part as well here, right? So there's a break from uh, nature landscape photography and landscape photography. Um, Ansel Adams, uh, and, and a large group of people move towards uh, nature photography. Again, what you've seen here. And landscape photography moves away um, in many ways towards the man-altered landscape. And so this exhibit, the new topographics photograph, uh, photographs of a man-altered landscape um, become really kind of a, a turning point, a pivoting point for landscape photography as fine art. And these photographers were looking at the West as well, but they were looking at it very differently. Right. It wasn't the way Adams was doing it. They were looking at the at these areas that um, were also the West. That uh, Joe, um, I forget the, the photographer's name, used to say that when he went to Yosemite, he felt like he was looking at it in quotation marks, right? Because it was like this idea without the cars and stuff. And so what they're trying to do is is develop a documentary style from um, brought about from Walker Evans. Um, and so they're using this form of neutrality to kind of say, all right, this in, in many ways is, is the West. It's more the West than um, what Ansel Adams has done. And they use kind of serial uh, and sequential uh, methods to kind of allude to these types of things. But one of the things, even though they seem so different, one of the things that they both end up doing is they, they, they really relay the idea that humans don't belong in these spaces. One, because it's too pristine, or two, because we've ruined everything. And so where are we supposed to situate ourselves, right? And so my, my argument is that we have to situate humans back into the environment. If we're part of the, of the, social, uh, of the ecological, the socio-ecological processes, then we have to inject ourselves back into it. 
not as a form of activism, but as a form of acknowledgement around how we play in this space. And it has to be informed, again, by artistic and scientific approaches. And so some of the questions we start, or I start thinking about is what human environment, environment relationships questions do we now ask? Right? What reflexive practice must we be engaged in? And if we're transitioning from the man-altered landscape to planet, what does that mean for us? Right? If this is the age of humans, then it can also be the age of humanity. It's, it's a, a, an approach towards stewardship. So we have the ability to take action and have agency. So I'm gonna give you um, my project, my actual photo project here. Um, I started thinking a lot about this when I was doing my PhD in sustainability. We used to abstract ideas a lot. And so I said, well, how do you take sustainability personally? What do you? Uh, no one said nothing. I'm sure that's been up there for like 15 minutes. Ruined all the pictures. So I took on this this project of my backyard primarily because um, we abstract sustainability so much in it kind of in, in academia, or we did in my in my program. And so I started really thinking about what does sustainability look like personally? What does it mean to to practice sustainability? And the reason that the backyard was so interesting at first, one, because it's a place that I, I can see every day, but two, because it was so nasty when I moved in. Like, there was nothing there. It was just like dirt and thorns. Um, and then the rains came, and I realized that the desert is just waiting for water and for other things to come to, to bloom. And then it returns to kind of this process, right? And so I started really getting interested in, in these places, and in, in, in this place that we really rarely think about seasonality within the desert, but you have to train again your eye. And so I started going through this process of looking at things both at different resolutions, right? How close could I get to discover this space? What was the interaction of what we consider wildlife in the, uh, in the city and, and the pets that we had? And we weren't, all, we weren't thinking about turning this place into kind of a native landscape either, saying like, what did we have here? We very much acknowledged that we lived in the space, we engineered this space, but we could engineer it in a way where we could use it and other animals could use it as well. I thought a lot about, about geochemical processes that you could think of scaling in, uh, in and out. And so this to me kind of really represented this idea of, of uh, volcanic uh, processes, even if it was just metaphor. Again, it was like, how closely were you going to study the biotic community in this space? I would also start thinking about the backyard as kind of a sculptural space. And so I would have the tree surfaces dump all this in front of my, in front of my yard. And then I would wheelbarrow it in the back. And so it kind of served two purposes. One was kind of to keep the dirt down and to provide nutrients for the soil. But then I started really thinking about, like, I have all this material. How do I actually turn it into something different? I became really aware of um, natural pruning processes. So these little beetles, which I considered pests at first, would eat my flowers all the way down to the ground. But then I realized that when they ate them all the way down, they came back even better. So things that I was learning. I uh, played the faux archaeologist, you know, collecting artifacts from the backyard. These are pottery shards of former residents. And you probably have residents before then, and so you start finding these stories that take place. Um, we were planting a tree and found that somebody had buried their bird in the backyard. Pottery shards we might consider more like pottery shards. And I also thought a lot about uh, urban ecology and predator-prey relationships. And so in the city, predator-prey relationships are pigeons and cats sometimes. They're not the way we think about them in, in uh, the wild, as, as we might coin it. I started becoming really familiar with, uh, again, the pulses of the backyard. So when lizards were laying their eggs, where they might lay them, how they kind of set up shelter, and where to kind of stay away from. I was kind of also interested in, again, the sublime, the celestial within the backyard. And so the picture actually on the bottom um, is during an eclipse. So these little crescents that you see actually are, so sunspots, these are the, the eclipse coming through the trees. 
And so experiencing these wonders of nature in, in these very personal spaces. Again, scale became really important, both temporal scale and spatial scale. So I would think about these processes, um, you know, as they related to the, the, the backyard where I spent so much time. And I also took on a little bit of natural history in the kind of full context of um, one telling stories about these places, um, but going back to alternative processes. So this print is actually a, a physical albumin print, a print that, um, that a lot of photographers were making in the early 1900s. And so I went back to those processes as well as ways of kind of exploring um, what this idea of natural history was in, in a space like the backyard in the dust storms that would come in to Phoenix. Patterns that you might find in the backyard. A bouquet of hornworms. This is one of um, my uh, exciting moments in the backyard. Um, we didn't, I didn't have worms. The, it was like rock solid dirt. And so kind of through this process of remediating with all this uh, a tree um, uh, clippings and, and compost, I started to get worms again. And so it's something that seems so simple, um, but becomes be, held a lot of value for me in this, in this space. And so this is how the yard uh, ended up when I left. Um, I didn't mention that this was a rental. So I thought, I thought a lot about this in the context of a rental. Um, that in doing this work, you change, your, you yourself are changed. So it's not about owning these things, but about the process of going through these things. Two years later, that's what it looked like when I had left. Um, and what was really interesting is when I knocked on the door, I found out that it was another sustainability student that lived there. So we went from this, to this, to this. And it really brings home, again, another of Leopold's quotes, that no important change in ethics was ever accomplished without an internal change in our intellectual emphasis, loyalties, affections, and convictions. That's it. <laughs>